A growing area of drug development that I find really fascinating and exciting is reversible covalent inhibition. And this shows promise in designing molecules that are really specific but are also long lasting. And they can be used to inhibit, pro they can be designed to inhibit proteins such as kinases, um, so proteins that add phosphate groups to other molecules like other proteins to do signaling pathways. Sometimes these get dysregulated in cancer. These can be um, drugs that target like proteins proteases such as viral proteases as we see with Paxlovid and the basic idea with these inhibitors is they have a part that is going to basically provide a bigger binding surface and provide the specificity that matches like the active site of the enzyme so where the activity in the enzyme actually takes place. And, but these interactions are going to be weaker, kind of like the normal, we would normally think of a drug binding through non-covalent interactions, interactions that can like come in off, on and off reversibly. But then what happens is once it's bound, now in the specific target, it's going to have a amino acid residue sticking out. So a part of the protein, such as like a lysine or a cysteine residue, these can be reactive. And so they can react to the part of the reversible covalent inhibitor that we call a reactive warhead. And so this has a group that kind of like complements the group here. And so this is typically like a nucleophilic amino acid, more on this in a minute, and this would be like an electrophilic warhead. What happens now is once your drug is bound, now these the nucleophile can attack this electrophile and you get a covalent bond. This covalent bond is stronger than the non-covalent bond, so this is going to help lock the drug here. But it's reversible. It's not as strong as like the bonds holding together this protein. There are different strengths of covalent bonds and we'll get more into this. But these bonds, these the type of bonds that are forming between the drug and the enzyme are going to be reversible. And this is important because it can limit, um, like if you have, say you want to end, you want to limit some of the enzyme but because maybe it's gotten dysregulated. Maybe you have a kinase um, has become dysregulated, um, but you still need some of the kinase activity. And so by allowing this to be reversible, you can reduce kind of like over inhibition. And also it, importantly though, you are, because you require this, it's kind of like a two-step verification where you have this, you have to have the the part that matches like the active site of the enzyme, but then you also, you can do that, you can have the non-covalent interactions. So say this could then be interacting with similar kinases um, and forming these non-covalent interactions, but only the actual target is going to have that, um, that matching, that, that like re reactive amino acid that's actually going to react with the warhead. And so this way you have two factor verification. You have the one that this active site is going to match the inhibitor. It doesn't have to be an active site, but some sort of bond binding pocket. And this is going to match. And then you have the second step to kind of verify things. Because this first step is more rever easily reversible, you can have, if you have like off target binding, that's not going to be as off as long lasting. And because you're not getting the covalent interaction, you're getting the covalent interaction when you have the on-target binding. And so now you're increasing your dwell time on the right targets and minimizing it on the wrong targets. This can be really important because at similar enzymes have really similar active sites. And often the when we design, well, not we, but when scientists design enzyme inhibitors, they do so to inhibit the active site because that's where the activity is happening. And so it makes sense to inhibit the activity. If you want to, if you want to inhibit scissors, you do it by the blades, right? You don't just like stick something on the handle. And similarly, when we inhibit enzymes, we often do so by targeting the active site. We call these like orthosteric inhibitors. We can also have allosteric inhibitors that bind somewhere else on the enzyme, and maybe they change the enzyme in some way that's going to prevent it from actually doing its activity. But because we, so often these is done, we take like, do like drug screens. And so you take like little fragment screens. Um, so you have little fragments of drugs and you try to like fit them into, find which pieces bind. And you can do structural studies. So like x-ray crystallography, you can soak these fragments in with the crystals and see where they bind. And then you can see in the binding pocket, like where there are places that you can modify things. And so with 
when you're designing like one of these reversible covalent inhibitors, often you can do something by starting with a screen or by starting with some sort of non-covalent inhibitor molecule, some sort of like um, ATP mimic or something for a kinase. And then you can actually modify it in ways by taking advantage and looking around and seeing what potential reactive um, amino acids are actually in the vicinity that you can then target with a warhead. And then you can kind of attach a warhead onto here and do a lot, 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 optimization um, to make a molecule that would actually um, be soluble, be bioaccessible, um, be have minimal toxicity, and all of these various things. So it's not as simple as just sticking a warhead onto, onto, um, onto just like a, a normal-ish compound. Um, but so that's the basic idea. And it is this growing area of research and there's been some cool developments recently. Um, so part of the reason that triggered this was I saw a cool like um, review article um, discussing this paper that was doing um, some modifications with lysine. So this has been mostly done with like cysteine residues um, for reasons I'll get into. Um, but now they're uh, making advancements with targeting lysines, um, which offers promise too. Another important thing is that these warheads aren't like super duper strong. They require the specific environment of the active site. Um, so of the place where they're actually targeted, there's typically some sort of stabilizing, enhancing interactions that are going to increase the reactivity so that you don't just stick something really, really reactive in there that's going to go off and react with all sorts of different stuff. You wouldn't want that. And so you really want to be able to guide this warhead to where you want it to react and only have it react in that place. Um, and so there's a lot of work that goes into designing the chemistry of these warheads to try to make it so that they're not react very reactive when they're just like out and about in the cell. But then once they bind to the target in that specific environment, they become more reactive because of the molecular environment. Um, and so that's another really key um, distinction about these drugs and a thing that can be a big holdup when you're trying to do some sort of drug discovery. So this relates to why the recent advances in targeting lysines that I'm going to be talking about and that kind of helped propel this post were exciting is that lysines are more abundant in proteins than cysteines. And so this has like a double-edged sword type of thing where if you have a cysteine reaction thing, then it potentially has less off-target effects because there's less cysteines available to react with non-specifically. But if so, if you don't have a cysteine in the active site somewhere, then you don't have something that you could then target, but you're more likely to have a lysine because lysines are going to be more abundant. But because lysines are going to be a, more abundant, then you have to make sure that your warhead is really well reined in. And so, by having this, um, and so by advancing the technology for using lysines, um, that can help open up new avenues for drugs that don't have, for targets that don't have like a cysteine available to react. Another thing um, is that, so sometimes these inhibitors will inhibit like, the catalytic residue. Um, so like the catalytic cysteine of an active site. But other times these, um, these warheads can target non, non, non -cat non catalytic sorry that was a hard word to say non catalytic residues and this can offer advantages because those catalytic residues are more likely to be well conserved um so you're not getting like extra degree of specificity that you would have if you had that second um if you had that um nucleophilic attack site be somewhere that was more specific to that certain protein Speaking of jumbling up words, there's a few places where I think I slip up and say irreversible instead of reversible. Note that most of the time I'm going to be talking about reversible. There are a couple instances of when I'm talking about irreversible, so not reversible, but I hopefully it's clear in the discussion that which one I am talking about and in the figures and stuff. And I apologize, I don't have time to go through and check in every time I say reversible that I actually say reversible and not irreversible. And I, my brain just for some reason just keeps jumbling it up. Um, but yeah, so sorry about that.
Um, and so basically the big idea though is that you have this one part that is basically going to be doing these non-covalent interactions. You can get this great specificity. You can have this larger handle that is going to bind to the part that you want. And again, when I say specificity though, be, remember that this is not totally specific because a lot of enzymes, for example, have similar active sites, have similar substrate binding sites. And so the specificity isn't like perfect, but then you require the second step verification of having the nucleophilic amino acid there to react with your electrophilic warhead um, in the most common um, circumstances that it's that combination, but there can be different things potentially. But it's having that combination that is going to allow you to have this stronger interaction but stronger, but not irreversible. So it's not something like penicillin. With penicillin, you get reverse, you get irreversible covalent inhibition because what happens with penicillin is that when it binds, it kind of like the substrate breaks open. Um, and so then it gets like permanently stuck because it's not this, the bond it forms is really, really strong. Whereas with these bonds, they're weaker. So like a hydrolysis, so water can actually attack them and break them up. Um, and so you can get the, them not being permanent. Um, but you do have a longer dwell time and you have this specifically longer dwell time on your on targets and not your off targets. And so this can be really important for minimizing toxicity and side effects and all of this various things. So let's talk about how all this goes down and some examples such as Paxlovid. There are also um, reversible covalent inhibitors for not enzymes, but for other things like there's a inhibitor for hemoglobin uh, for the abnormal hemoglobin and sickle cell anemia that actually um, binds to the end terminus of one of the proteins and kind of prevents them from forming these long chains that can form in the um, with in people with sickle cell anemia um, it kind of stabilizes the form of hemoglobin that is less likely to form these chains um, and so it's like an allosteric modulator um, and it's not like a drug binding in the active site but it still is an example of this reversible covalent inhibition and so these things are really really cool um, but let's go back and discuss kind of the core concepts because I don't know about you but when I first heard about reversible covalent inhibition it seemed kind of like oxymoronic for me because I had always thought of covalent bonds as being like these super duper strong irreversible bonds and non-covalent bonds as being these loosey-goosey more like attractions but then the more I learned about biochemistry the more it made sense to me and the idea that covalent bonds aren't all created equal and so let's get into what we mean about this. So what do we even mean when we're talking about a covalent bond? So basically with a covalent bond, we're talking about atoms actually like kind of merging their electron clouds, so sharing pairs of electrons. Um, so atoms are made up of these smaller parts, subatomic particles. So you have your positively charged protons and your neutral neutrons, which hang out in this then central nucleus. And then they're surrounded by this cloud of electrons. And these electrons are negatively charged and they're going to be what is actually going to be interacting. And so when atoms form pairs of these, they form a bond. They can also fare, so, Form, share two pairs to form a double bond. But the basic thing is that they are sharing, they're actually sharing electrons. They're actually getting this like closer together. They're having or overlap of their electron orbitals. Um, but the basic, we often think of these as kind of irreversible, but they're not always irreversible. And so this can be kind of confusing. When we're talking about covalent bonds, we're talking about the actual bonds that are holding together molecules. So the bonds that are holding together water, the bonds that are holding together methane, the bonds that are holding together our DNA and our proteins. But when we talk about non-covalent bonds, these are more just like partial att charge attractions and things like um, these can be full charge or partial or charge. Um, these can be just like random temporary charge. Um, but basically you can get these regions of charge in like a neutral molecule, um, even by chance. And this can kind of allow you to have some sort of attractive force. But these are just attractions. And so they're not, their clouds aren't overlapping and they're not forming these stronger connections. But the, the complicating thing is that not all covalent bonds are created equal. So in a covalent bond, yes, you're sharing pairs of electrons, but you're not always sharing fairly. This is how we get polarity. This is how we can get partially charged regions of molecules like water. Like the reason why water is so sticky is because it's really polar. It has, it 
doesn't share its electrons barely. This oxygen is what we call electronegative, so it draws the electrons towards it, making it partly negative, and pulling them away from the hydrogens, making them partly positive. So this is a polar molecule. What happens when the oxygen has this tighter pull is that these, in addition to having the oxygen be having these partial charges, you can also make this hydrogen vulnerable to like break off and vulnerable to be attacked. And so these bonds are not like permanent. These bonds can have different degrees of kind of vulnerability. And when an atom is kind of unhappy with its current situation, then it might have the opportunity to find a seek out a better situation somewhere else. And this is how we can get atoms to react with one another, get molecules to react with one another to try to kind of like improve their situation. And so this often involves a nucleophile attacking an electrophile. And so a nucleophile is something that has more electrons or more electron density that it can comfortably handle. Um, they're sometimes, but not always, fully negative, so anionic, um, but they can also just be like, um, they can have more electron density than they can comfortably handle. Um, and so they then want to be able to kind of like share this responsibility, and so they need to find something with fewer electrons um, than wanted. Um, and so they look for an electrophile. And so a nucleophile is seeking out a nucleus. So the nucleus is where the protons are. So it's wanting to find those protons and it's going to find them in an electrophile, which is something that's looking for electrons. And so this electrophile is something with too few electrons or electron density. They're sometimes, but not always fully positive or cationic. Um, and some examples are this carbon and the carbonyl. So this oxygen is pulling away the electrons from this carbon making it vulnerable to attack. We see some of these sorts of electrophilic groups in our um, electrophilic warheads. Our nucleophile group is typically going to be a lysine or a cysteine um, on, the, on the protein. And so just a note about terminology, when we talk about amino acids in the context of proteins, we often refer to them as residues because they're no longer individual amino acids. Um, they have lost their amino part and their acid part um, in terms of their backbone because they use those to combine. And so now we call like the leftover part, the residue. And so these are going to be the side chains that are actually sticking out um, and poised in a position to be reactive. And cysteine is, um, and lysine are going to be nucleophilic. Um, and so these are going to have more electro these are going to have more electrons than they want, and they're going to be able to then attack an electrophile in order to kind of help share that electron burden. And so they like having the electrons in terms of like fulfilling their octet or what um, they like these electrons in terms of like fulfilling their outer shell, but they don't like them in terms of having more of this negative charge than they want. And so this is why they're going to be a tacky. Um, so cysteines, um, we've seen these, uh, we see these amino acids actually be reactive and form reversible covalent bonds in biochemistry naturally. And so we often, when we're talking about cysteine, a key thing about this cysteine is that it can form these um, crosslinks with other cysteines, these disulfide bridges. And this um, can be used to help kind of like sop up reactive oxygen species. So we see with glutathione, this can um, act as an antioxidant. And when you have these sulfur, um, you get these sulfur-sulfur crosslinks, um, to form cysteine and this glutathione, this can, um, like two glutathions can hook up. This is also going to be a kind of problem potentially for off-target activity if your electrophilic warhead is too active. And so they often screen against glutathione to make sure that it's not going to be too reactive to that off-target effect. And so sulfur is going to be more nucleophilic than oxygen uh, because its valence electrons are further away. So more about this in my post on cysteine, uh, but this is why we often see cysteines um, being targeted instead of like serines or threonines, um, which have the hydroxyl group, which are electronegative, um, but they're not as nucleophilic. Um, so sulfur is basically because it's 
one row down in the periodic table, it has this X additional shell compared to oxygen, its valence electrons are going to be farther away. And so they're going to be more easily able to react. But these bonds are also, because you have this, they're farther away, these bonds are going to be easier to break. And so we see that the bonds to sulfur are going to be more, more vulnerable to than the bonds to oxygen. And when we have individual cysteines, cysteine crosslinks can be reversed. Um, and so this is an example of reversible covalent um, binding or things, um, bond formation actually taking place in our cells. We also see examples of lysine being used to link things. Um, so lysine can be attached to like, and can be modified in various ways because it has this primary amino group on its ends. Um, and this primary amino group is then um, poised to be a tacky. Um, I'm taking advantage of this today. I'm doing some protein cross-linking, um, not with formaldehyde, but with a different cross-linker. But the basic idea is that this lysine can act as a nucleophile and attack an electrophile. And if you have an electrophile that is like bifunctional, that's able to form uh, multiple links to multiple things, then you can get this kind of two things to be linked together through a cross-link. Um, and so these are examples of kind of places that we've already looked at lysine and cysteine being used to form crosslinks. And one of the things that I learned when I was doing, when I was trying formaldehyde crosslinking once, was that this bond is actually vulnerable. And so when you're for example, preparing to do an SDS page, you don't want to heat this up if you're using formaldehyde because those crosslinks will be reversed. When we're talking about in drug discovery, they're typically being reversed by hydrolysis. Um, and so they're going to basically water is going to attack. And so we don't really, you might not think water that is that like reactive, but water can be really reactive, especially if you have a vulnerable bond and this water can be activated. Um, basically, the water can then serve to attack the bond and reverse it. And because if you have one of these vulnerable bonds, that is subject to this hydrolysis. And so this is a good review article if people are interested, but you can see some of the warheads that are used to target different amino acids. Um, and various things. And you can also see this rise in the, in, the rise in um, covalent inhibitors um, in, the, um, in the recent years. And so not all of these inhibitors are reversible. Um, some of them are irreversible, but many, there's a growing um, interest in these reversible covalent inhibitors. So in the classical, like, non-covalent competitive inhibitor, it often mimics the substrate so it mimics the thing that the enzyme is going to act on and it competes for that site, binding to that site. And so if you were to remove, like if you were to have more of the actual substrate, you can compete it out, if you can dilute it out. Um, and so you can imagine that you would have to have a constant high concentration of this inhibitor in order to be inhibiting. And so if you would have to keep dosing this drug at potentially high concentrations um, for as long as you needed to treat something. If you had, if the, the high, if you, you can have a higher affinity, which means that you wouldn't need as high of a concentration, but you still have this issue um, of dwell time. Whereas if you had something that was actually staying on longer, then you could get advantages from having a covalence linkage that you don't need to have the um, as high of a, like, or as long of a supply. If you have an irreversible, then you don't need it. Um, it's even less, uh, but reversibly still, um, when you need to dose, but potentially um, lower amounts or less frequent dosages because you would have a longer lasting action. And you're getting this added um, bonus where this is increasing the specificity because you have this two-factor authentication where you have to have the, like, the matching site, but then you also have to have that site, have that well-positioned um, 
well-positioned residue in position to attack with this carefully designed um, reactive warhead. Um, and so this is the basic idea with reversible covalent inhibition is that you form these bonds, these covalent bonds that are covalent, so they're stronger, but they're not, they're not invincible. And so when we think about covalent bonds, although we often think about them as being irreversible, um, when we think about it more, even our protein and our DNA are subject to being broken. And so we typically, we can, those so strong bonds, they often in our cells and stuff, they require enzymes help to break them up. So things like proteases that cut proteins and things like nucleases that cut new DNA and RNA. But those, those DNA chains and those RNA chains and those protein chains, they can actually be broken by water. They can be broken by hydrolysis. It just takes, we often, it, it takes like acidic, like extreme conditions, like extreme acidic or basic conditions, um, these things can actually break. And so if you have an even weaker bond to start with, then you can have hydrolysis be able to break these under physiological conditions, especially if the like the right environment is there. And so, and so we can have these sort of more weaker bond, covalent bonds, that the water is able to break um, these bonds that are more vulnerable, typically coming from the nucleoph a nucleophile um, such as a cysteine or a lysine attacking an electrophile in our, um, in our, in our warhead. And then this can be um, still, it's still vulnerable. And so it can be attacked again, um, in this case being attacked by water. And so you get hydrolysis, you get breakage of this bond. So nothing is truly, truly irreversible, um, although we do call some things rever irreversible inhibition. Um, it's all a matter of degree. And so if we think about a reaction, we have some sort of situation where we have our reactants have some energy and the products have some energy. And if the products are a much lower, much lower free energy, they're much, much happier, it's going to be harder that, for them to go backwards. But nothing is ever truly, theoretically at least, irreversible because there always is that possibility that you can get back up that long side of the hill, that you can get back up here um, and fall to the other side. Um, and so if the bond, if it's harder to um, break that bond, you're going to have this be less likely. But then if it's easier, this will be more likely. And we can imagine that you can actually tailor these drugs in order to have different like stabilities of the bond. So how like labile they are, how subject to breaking apart or breaking off and dissociating are they? Um, and so this can be an area, this is an area of research is where people are looking and trying to make those compounds, make the irreversible inhibitors have more like fine tune the dwell times for specific circumstances. And so all of this is a really um, cool area of research to keep an eye on. And so here is an example from a recent article, um, this News and Views piece that was discussing this paper that was published in the Journal of the American Chemical Society um, about lysine, tar lysine targeting reversible covalence inhibitors with a long residence time. So basically this is, um, so an aldehyde, as we were looking at before, an aldehyde is going, this is going to be electrophilic, this carbon, because this oxygen is pulling away the electron density. And then we saw how we have a lysine on a protein can be nucleophilic. So this can form this imine bond. But this bond is too labile, it's too easily reversible. So water is good at breaking it up. And so this doesn't have a very long um, half-life. It doesn't have, it doesn't linger long on the protein. This was a older version of um, this, like using a boronic acid group to kind of stabilize this imine. So if you stabilize this product, you make this less vulnerable to attack. And therefore this is going to last longer. Um, but they found that this was a lot even more efficient if they added this other group. Now they're forming this product that's even better stabilized. Um, and so this is going to be better at, so you can see it takes like two water molecules. This is going to be better at stabilizing the, um, this product 
And therefore, this is going to be even slower to actually reverse. Another example of a drug that acts as a reversible covalent inhibitor is Paxlovid. Um, so more specifically, this PFO7321332, I, I don't know if it has a better name by now, um, but this is basically an inhibitor of the SARS-CoV-2, so like the coronavirus's main protease. Um, and so it uses this protease, it makes this long chain of proteins, this polyprotein chain, and then it chops it up using its proteases um, and so it uses this main protease to cut a lot of these apart into active proteins. The, a protease inhibitor is designed so that it stops this, um, this protein and then prevents this, um, the virus from making functional proteins. Here you can see this molecule that um, is used as this inhibitor. It has this big part that's going to act as like a handle and kind of bind to the active site and allow um, all the, you have all of these opportunities to form these non-covalent interactions. So you can have, imagine having things like hydrogen bonds, um, hydrophobic interactions, all sorts of different types of places where you could have interactions with the proteins and with the various things in the active site. And this is going to be helping provide that initial affinity and that initial holding it in place. And then you have this electrophilic warhead. And so you can see that this warhead isn't very big. It's just this nitrile group. Um, and so you could basically imagine designing this whole molecule um, and then only having to figure out where to place this one group. And of course, it's not that easy, but, but a key feature thing is that you, can, you have all of these places where you can be optimizing things and where you can be putting in specificity for, the very, for that specific protein. And then if it has that additional second factor authentication, then you can get the actual covalent bond formation. And so when the, when the protein, this is going to um, target a catalytic cysteine. So this is the main, pro, and PRO is a, a cysteine protease. And so it uses a cysteine to attack the, um, to attack the, um, to attack and break the protein, the peptide bond. And so when it does this, it's going to get covalently stuck on there. Um, but this is reversible, so then it can get unstuck. And so it's not permanent. And this can be good if you have protein proteases in your cells that this might accidentally interact with. Um, you wouldn't want it to be permanent. Um, and also, if um, in cases where it's not a viral protease, but if it's like your own pro protease is just overactive, you wouldn't want to inhibit it like completely and all the time and stuff. And therefore you wouldn't want like permanent inhibition. But by having drugs that have this longer residence time, you can give them less frequently um, without having to worry about that. Another example is, um, so this isn't an enzyme inhibitor, but this was a very cool um, drug that's actually FDA approved, um, GBT440. It's an orally bioavailable R-state stabilizer of sickle cell hemoglobin. Um, so this drug, Voxelator, is used to treat sickle cell anemia, um, which is a disease caused when there's this mutation in the hemoglobin protein. So this hemoglobin protein is responsible for carrying oxygen through the blood. And when you have this mutation, it causes the abnormal hemoglobins to link up and form these long fibers um, that then cause the blood cells to get misshapen and therefore they clog up arteries. This can, as um, hemoglobin has these two main forms. So it has these four binding sites and when it binds to oxygen, it's in this relaxed um, form. And then when it has low oxygen, it's going to be in this tot or T form. And it's actually this low oxygen form that is going to be more prone to the sickling. So what Voxelator does is it stabilizes this R state. So it stabilizes this oxygen um, bound state and therefore prevents the formation of these long fibers. And how it does this is it forms a reversible covalent bond to the, um, to the end terminus of the protein. And so in addition to having lysines, you, can ha you have the, um, the end terminus of a protein has a free primary amino group. And so this primary amino group can then be bonding to this 
you can see this aldehyde group here that's vulnerable to attack um, was by this in terminus, and therefore you get this complex. This is going to increase the oxygen affinity and keep it um, delay the polymerization. Um, and so this is a cool example of a reversible covalent inhibition. In this case, though, so it's not inhibiting a kinase, it's not inhibiting an enzyme, it's inhibiting um, the polymerization of this oxygen carrying hemoglobin. So I've been talking about examples of reversible covalent inhibition, but there are also important um, examples of irreversible covalent inhibition. So we've talked about penicillin, but there's also um, examples more like modern day examples, I guess, in terms of actual recent discoveries. So this is an example of an irreversible covalent inhibitor, but a really exciting one um, is Satorisib and it was called like AMG 510. And it is a covalent inhibitor of KRAS, a mutant form of KRAS. Um, so KRAS is this GDPA, GTPase. Um, and so basically it's really important in signaling pathways. It helps, ex it exchanges um, a GTP for GDP, or it exchanges D GDP to GTP. Um, and then like in response to upstream signaling stuff, and then it goes and does downstream signaling stuff. What happens in some cancers is that there's this mutation, this, um, there's multiple mutations, but there's this one, G12C, and it's found in some cancers, and it makes this like hyperactive, and this is then leads to excessive signaling, um, which can cause um, serious problems, and so people have been wanting to inhibit it. But the problem was that this molecule doesn't really offer good things for inhibiting. And then in 2013, the Shokat Lab at UCSF published this really groundbreaking work showing that there was an allosteric site that could be um, targeted by small molecules. And the site was right next to the um, to this mutant residue. This mutant residue is a cysteine. And as we've been talking about, cysteine offers the opportunity for you to covalently um, like to attack a, an electrophilic warhead. And so it was able to show that, so here's the GDP bound, and here is where the um, this allosteric site, so it's not actually in the active site, um, but what it's doing is it's binding here, and it's going to form a covalent crosslink here. So they did this work in 2013, and there was a bunch of optimization, and then Amgen, um, by like pharmaceutical companies and stuff, Amgen in, um, developed this drug, it was called AMG 510, and now it's called Serotacib. Um, and this was actually approved, in, FDA approved in 2021. Really exciting stuff. And now there is a second one, um, this Adagrasib, which is, they're seeking FDA approval. Um, so we could have a second one soon. And this is really exciting because this drug was thought to be undruggable. Um, so it binds to, <laughs> GDP really joins to like GDP or GDP really, 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 really tightly. Um, and there's a lot of those in the cell. And so it's going to, if you wanted an inhibitor, it would have to actually, a, a reversible inhibitor, something that was just kind of like competing for an, the active site, would have to bind really, really tightly. And so that's not really like an imaginably high, you need unimaginably high concentrations or you need to have a super, super, super tight interaction. And even then, if you're just mimicking the active site, well, then it could have off-target effects. But if they, they didn't, what wasn't known beforehand was that there's this allosteric site that was capable of acting as a binding site, but it's this kind of weird shallow site. And they were able to, however, divine uh, molecules that because of having this mutated residue where you have a cysteine here, now if you design a molecule that'll fit in this region, you can then attach the um, and have it designed it so that you have the electrophilic warhead in a position to interact with the cysteine. And the cyst it can form a covalent linkage with the cysteine and a permanent one. So this is a really, um, really groundbreaking discovery and hopefully it will lead to um, really 
it's just the beginning, hopefully, of inhibitors. And we really have this, um, the Shokat lab to thank for a lot of this really, of this fundamental work. You know, it was later picked up by like pharmaceuticals and stuff. Um, I heard um, Kevin Shokat talk at, talk here and it was just like really fascinating and so um yeah so really exciting stuff with this um and so again this was a irreversible inhibitor but because it requires this mutant this mutation it requires it to have this cysteine here and this cysteine is the mutated residue that's causing the problems with the protein so only the mutated version is going to get be able to be susceptible to having this covalent linkage. So you can imagine that maybe the normal version might would bind it, but it wouldn't form this covalent linkage. And you need this covalent linkage um, in order to have it stuck more permanently. Um, and in this case, permanently, permanently. And so this is targeting only the mutated version. So if, say someone has the normal version and a cancerous version, um, the cancerous version would be targeted, but not the normal version. Um, and by like cancerous, I just mean like mutation that causes cancer or just, that's helping um, the cancer thrive. And so those mutated versions would get targeted, but not the normal version. And this is going to further limit your off-target effects. And therefore you can, don't have to worry about the fact that this is would be a permanent interaction. And instead that would be an optimal thing because you would have this better specificity, like the super duper specificity, and you don't have to worry about like over inhibiting something that you know, that your body relies on. Um, so this is um, kind of a special case where you have this like perfect opportunity um, with the cysteine residue here. Um, but it then you don't have to dose as much and you don't have to worry about the affinity problems from having such a high affinity um, binding site for the substrate because you are permanently decapacitating for, um, this, this protein um, when you have make that covalent linkage. And I hope that this was interesting to you um, because I found it really interesting, but I'm a geek. So I may be a big geek, um, but I'm not an expert in pharmacology. I deal more with biochemistry. Um, so hopefully I got all of the details right. I just thought it was really, really interesting and I wanted to talk about it.